Now that the technology has failed, we are ready to get started. <laughs> and continuing that same note, I'd like to say it is a considerable honor to come up here to discover that Amazon has decided that the retail value of my books is now zero, so they are giving them away. <laughs> Which is the kind of thing that an author really likes to hear. <laughs> And I also am honored to be in the presence of a gentleman who will come up and give a talk about how the software absolutely, positively has to work correctly in front of a slide that looks like that. <laughs> so, so, it would be an honor to work for you at Facebook. <laughs> I want to give a talk talking about universal references and in particular what happens when you try to combine one language feature, which I call universal references, with another language feature, which is overloading, and what happens at the intersection of those two locations. Uh, to get started, I want to talk about the two functions, standard move and standard forward. It has been my experience that these things lead to some confusion, so let me make it as simple as I possibly can. These functions do nothing but cast. That's all they do. They are casts. They generate zero executable code. They don't do anything. So, if I say standard move and I have an expression, it casts the expression to an R value. Nothing gets moved here. When you see move, nothing's being moved. <laughs> It's casting it to an R value. Now, whatever it's being passed to probably will then perform a move. But the actual call to the function move does nothing except cast it to an R value. So, standard move is an unconditional cast to an R value. That's all it does. It doesn't move anything. And standard forward, if I have a template it takes a tref ref parameter, a universal reference parameter, and somewhere in there, I say I want to do forward of this parameter. Now, there was a call site that called this function. The expression at the call site was either an L value or an R value. So, for example, if I have my favorite type widget and an object of that type W, and I call F with W, W is an L value, has a name, you can take its address, as a result, when I call f, what this parameter here was passed is an l value. However, in this call here, if I take w and I unconditionally cast it to be an r value, all this does is pass to f exactly the same object, except as an r value. And under those conditions, this parameter, param, becomes an r value, which means Inside this template, maybe what was passed to param was an L value, but maybe it was an R value. What forward does is discovers whether it was an L value or an R value. In other words, what was passed in was an L value or an R value. Now, param itself, because it is something you can take the address of, param itself is an L value. What forward does is it casts param to an R value if and only if the argument that was passed into param at the call site was an R value. It generates zero code. So forward is a conditional cast. Now this is only peripheral to what we'll be talking about, but it really helps in reading the code to understand that with standard move, nothing gets moved, and with standard forward, nothing gets forwarded. <laughs> the names suggest how they are intended to be used, but what they actually do is simply perform casts. I believe that in the talk description I said I would spend one slide on universal references. That is true, I will spend one slide on universal references. And then I will spend a second slide on universal references. <laughs> Still, one slide I did spend on universal references. <laughs> a universal reference has a particular syntactic form. The syntactic form is T ampersand ampersand. And universal references always have the characteristic that the type T will be deduced. Those two things are essential to have what I call a universal reference. You have to have the right syntactic form, which is tref ref, 
and the type T must be a deduced type. Universal references arise in two contexts. One of them is function template type parameters. That's the only one I'm going to be worrying about tonight. They also arise in the presence of auto variables because auto also has type deduction. Some of you may have read an article that I wrote about universal references, or you may have seen a talk I gave introducing the idea of universal references. In the talk and in the papers, I also talked about um, universal references in the context of type def and decal type. I have since decided that that is not a useful way to think about universal references. So, as a result, I no longer use the term universal references to talk about type def and decal type. Everything I said before, from a technical perspective, continues to be completely true. But my motivation for introducing the terminology universal reference is because I believe it makes it easier to understand how things work, and I have now decided that I don't think it makes things any easier to understand in the case of type def and decal type. So that's the reason that I backed off of that. The crucial characteristic behaviorally of a universal reference is that a universal reference being a reference must be initialized. If the initializer of a universal reference is an L value, then the universal reference becomes an L value reference. So even though it looks like that in the source code, that is what it actually becomes semantically. And if the universal reference is initialized with an R value, then it remains T ref except that now it's an R value reference. So, if I have a template for some function f which takes T ref ref, I have the proper syntactic form, and I have type deduction, this is a universal reference, which means it might really be an L value reference, or it might be an R value reference. W is a widget, CW is a const widget. If I call f with w, this is passing an L value. We will get type deduction up here. Parameters type will then be widget ref. It becomes an L value reference. So that's what the source code says, but that's what it actually is. If I initial it with a constant object, the const will be captured by the reference, and as a result, I will end up with an L value reference to const. The point is, if you pass in L values, you end up with L value references despite what is written here. If I take the widget W, unconditionally cast it to be an R value, then parameters type will become widget ref ref, an R value reference. And similarly, if I take the const widget, unconditionally cast it to be an R value, I will end up with an R value reference to const. This is the unique characteristic of universal references. From a technical perspective, in terms of the standard and the official lingo of C11, there is no such thing as a universal reference. What I call universal references, technically, they're R value references in a reference collapsing context. And if you've seen the talk that I gave before, if you read the article, I talk a lot about reference collapsing. I take all that for granted here. If you don't know about reference collapsing, number one, congratulations. And number two, you don't need to know it for this talk. All you need to remember is this. You need two things to have a universal reference. You need to have the proper syntactic form, T ref ref, and you also need to have type deduction. If either of those things is missing, you do not have the behavior that I have described. So, let's suppose if a call site, the caller says, I want to call f of widget. If I go back one slide, they are explicitly specifying what this parameter here is. So, if they say, um, this says, I really want to pass in widget as the parameter type. Under those conditions, going back a slide, this becomes widget ref ref, which becomes an R value reference. So there's no type deduction here. So if I pass CW, this is an L value. This line will not compile. I am attempting to initialize an R value reference with an L value. Because the type of the parameter becomes const widget ref ref. No type deduction, therefore no universal reference. Therefore, we fall back on the usual rules. Usual rules are ampersand ampersand equals R value reference. Is that a question or just stretch it? Okay. Another example of where there's no type deduction. If I call F with a braced parameter list, templates 
do not deduce a type for braced parameterless. There's no type deduction possible here. This line will not compile. So under the conditions where somebody passes in a braced parameter list, it is as if this template here didn't even exist because you can't deduce a type. Interestingly, if you do the same thing with auto and have a braced uh, initializer list, then it will actually deduce the type of initializer list event. But that's an aside. It does not affect our discussion today. So that's universal reference. So the guideline that I want to talk about tonight is this one. You should avoid overloading on universal references. And I'm going to make two arguments. The first one is very short. The first argument is overloading on universal references makes no sense. And the reason it makes no sense is a universal reference binds to anything. Okay, almost anything. We know, for example, it doesn't bind to braced initializer list. We've just seen that. But setting aside edge cases, a universal reference can be an L-value reference, so it can bind to L-values. It can be an R-value reference, so it binds to R-values. It can bind to things that are const, it can bind to things that are volatile, it can bind to things that are const and volatile, even if you write it as volatile const. They bind to everything, except for a few edge cases. So, overloading is a mechanism to say, for these types of arguments I want to do this, but for these types of arguments I want to do this other thing. Well, if you want to distinguish between two kinds of things in the world, it doesn't make any sense at all to write a function that says, I will take everything. <laughs> so conceptually, it doesn't make sense to use a universal reference and at the same time to overload. You're contradicting yourself. So that's the, the short explanation. Um, being C++ and you being C++ developers, I know that everybody's thinking, yeah, 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 what happens if you try? <laughs> <laughs> will it compile? If so what will it do? And do we care? How could we use this? <laughs> Let's start with the training wheels. L-value references and R-value references and overload. So this is not talking about universal references. So I have a class which I call normal class. I have a function called do work. It takes an L value reference to const, another overload do work, which takes an R value reference. Now, there is absolutely nothing suspicious about this code. What this code says is I have a function called do work, and the way I do it is different for L values than for R values. Generally speaking, what this is saying is if somebody passes me an L value, I'm going to copy this parameter internally, probably. And the reason I think I'm going to copy it is because it's const. And this says, I'm going to take an R value. Oop, um, it would help, actually, let me fix it. it Works perfectly in my head. <laughs> It's easy enough to get confused, it doesn't help if the slides are wrong. <coughs> Thank you, Leonardo. Image toolbox. I will sleep better tonight than you. <laughs> okay. That'd be a widget. So this says, do work takes a normal class object. This function will take L values and probably copy it. This function will take R values and will probably do a move on it. That's normally why you overload. So, yeah, it's supposed to be widget. Do work 
takes an L value widget, do work takes an R value widget. I'm separating the world into L values and R values. So now, if NC is a normal class object, W is a widget object, CW is a const widget object, then if I call do work with the L value W, then I call do work taking an L value reference, so the first one up here, if I call do work with an R value of this, then I'm going to call this version of do work. And I realize I haven't updated the comments, but I'm hopeful you can map between the two. If I have a const widget, this is also an L value, so it is going to um, call the const to rep one. And if I call do work moving the const widget, then it is um, going to. <coughs> Uh, this one will actually bind to the R value. Really? It'll bind to the R value. What we have here is a constant object which we've cast to an R value. So we have a choice here. Um, I just got really messed up tonight, aren't I? It would bind to the first overload. Uh, yeah, I think it would bind to the first overload. <laughs> I am so glad I drove up here to give this talk. <laughs> Alright, I think this is going to get us where we need to go, and I apologize for the mistakes. value argument binds to the L value overload. The R value argument binds to the R value overload. Any disagreement since I clearly have made mistakes up to this point? <laughs> I want to point out at this juncture in the talk that suddenly it's looking like Amazon made the appropriate decision. <laughs> What they usually learn fairly quickly is that if you want to be able to distinguish L values and R values, then what you do is you write two overloads, one of them is for L values and one of them is for R values. This is a completely reasonable thing to do and it works exactly as you would expect. Yeah, hold it. If you leave off the cost, does it change things? The overload or which ones are selected? Um, okay, so the question is if I leave off the cost, is it going to change anything? In this particular example, it's not going to change anything. You can, you can run into cases where it does, but basically this is an L value, so under no conditions can it bind to this overload. So it's going to be unambiguous if we get rid of this const here. And in this case here, we have, uh, if we get rid of the const, then we would have an overload taking a non-const L value reference and a non-const R value reference. And the overloading rules say, as a tiebreaker, if you have equally good matches and you have an R value, it goes to the R value overload rather than the L value. So eliminating the const would not change anything in this case. Okay. So completely reasonable, nothing wrong. So what a lot of people do is they say, well, OK, let's generalize this. So I'm going to take do work, and I'm going to turn it into a template. And I'm going to make this do work overload, and I'm going to turn this into a template. Now, the first thing is this will compile. It seems like everything is pretty much the same as it was before. The difference is that this 
template here is now taking a universal reference. This is no longer an R value reference. This is now a universal reference. We have type deduction and we have the appropriate syntactic form. And what that means is this overload can also bind to L values. So this is a fundamentally different thing from what we had on the previous slide. And the behavior reflects that. The code will compile. So in this case there, this I called this class messed up, which apparently was named after me, but let's move on. <laughs> W is a widget, CW is a const widget here. So it's a m.do work. Well, in this case, what I have is a non const widget L value. Now, because it is an L value, it could bind to the, the L value reference to const. That's a viable overload. But this can be instantiated so that this becomes an L value reference to a widget, because this is an L value. And with this instantiation, there will be no const here. So this widget is not const. To bind to this overload would require the addition of const to make a complete match, whereas it can match this without any addition of const. As a result, this call to do work with an L value calls this overload. It does not call this overload. Many people are surprised by this because they're still thinking this handles L values and this handles R values, but that's not the way it is any longer because this handles L values and R values. I'm going to, uh, okay, so if I now say do work, I take the widget W and I cast it to, to be an R value reference. So, excuse me, an R value. So this is now an R value. Well, I, um, as an R value, this is definitely an L value reference, so I can't bind the R value to this function here. But I can instantiate this here with an R value to get widget ref ref, and as a result, both of these functions call the same template. So on the previous slide without the universal reference, we were able to distinguish L values and R values. On this slide, just by generalizing it to make it so it uses universal references on one of the overloads, these two functions now call the same template, in particular this one. And to be honest, I'm actually going to skip the const overloads because I no longer trust the slides that I put together. But at this point, I've made my fundamental observation, which is if I go back one slide, if I have an L value reference overload and an R value reference overload, that permits me to separate L value reference, excuse me, L values and R values. But if instead I use a universal reference, in the case of non-const objects, I can no longer separate L values and R values. They both go to the same overload. Many people find this surprising. Yeah? So if you remove const, this will not compile? Uh, okay, so another question I've got. So let's suppose we, it's this const here you want to get rid of. So if we get rid of this one here, um, under those conditions I have an, an L value here, so the L value can't, um, let's see, to a tref and con, a tref, ref, um, I'm, I'm not certain. I'm pretty sure that if I get rid of the const, this one here will then. Is it that big U is that? Yeah. You still have one that's a better match, though, don't you? Yes, yeah, no, <laughs> no better match. I'm going to go with, I don't know right now. The reason, the, the, the problem we have here is that um, this template can be instantiated to be the same instantiated as this one without the const. I think the partial uh, the partial um, ordering rules are going to kick in and prefer this one, but I'm not going to stake my life on it, so I'm not certain. In practice, what tends to happen is people get used to this idiom, which is correct, and then they generalize it to this, and that's when things start breaking down. So. Certainly, we can look at the standard and we can figure out what would happen if we omitted the const here, but I don't, I'm not going to worry about that right now. I mean, there is an answer, I just don't happen to know offhand what it is. And I apologize. Okay. So, let's get away from the general idea and talk more specifically here. So, I've got a function called name from ID. It takes some identifier and it kicks out a string. So basically, you look up somebody by their identifier, and it tells you what their name is. That's what it's going to be used for. So here's a person class. I've got a constructor from a string, which is the name of the person. I've got a constructor for a person from an ID, in which case we look up their name, 
using name from ID, and in both cases we initialize a data member of type string. So either pass in the name directly or you pass in the ID, which is used to look up the name. And either way, we initialize the string object here. So JKR is a string object for JK Rowling, and I say, okay, person P1 is initialized with an object of type string, calls this, um, calls this overload unambiguously. This is not a surprise. Now, what we then do is we copy the name that we received into the data member of name. So this is going to cost us a copy of a string. If I say person P2 is John Grisham, this is going to take char star. We will construct a temporary standard string object. The temporary standard string object will be bound to this parameter here, which will then be copied into the name. Now notice that we created a temporary, and we copied it into the data member. Now ideally, we would have preferred to move it. But with this way of declaring the parameter, you can't distinguish L values and R values. So we have to assume they're all L values, and we have to copy them all the time. If I say person P3 has this ID, that will call this overload, it will look up the name. Name from ID will return a string object as its return value, which will then be copied, uh, actually in this case will be um, moved into name. And if I say person P4, if I look up the name from the ID myself, then this will give me back a string, that's an R value, I pass that string as an R value to this overload, which turns it into an L value, because it's bound to an L value reference. And that object is then copied into string. So we are actually creating a temporary outside, which we then copy into the data. So the code compiles. It does what we would like it to do. But we notice that we're copying a temporary here and we're copying an R value here. We would prefer to avoid these copies. Now, a way we can avoid these kinds of problems is to use perfect forwarding. So what I can do is I can write the person constructor now taking a universal reference parameter. So this says, I'm willing to accept anything, which I will then forward into my name data member. So give me whatever you want. I'm going to forward it, but I've got an overload for when you give me an integer. When you give me an integer, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look it up in name from ID, and then I'm going to initialize name from that. If we, this code will compile, better compile. <laughs> Same example with JK Rowling, P1 with JKR. This now takes the um, L value string and perfect forwards it to initialize this, it will then copy JKR into name because it's an L value, so we get a copy, just like we did before. If I say P2 with John Grisham, this is actually going to take that string literal and forward it to the string constructor through the forwarding, which will then construct the string directly from the string literal, which means we don't pay for any temporaries, we don't pay for copying or moving the temporaries. If I say person P3 is 44245, this is an integer. So it calls the integer overload, just like it did before. So it behaves exactly like it did before. If I say name from ID for 44245, then name from ID, well, it's on the previous slide. Name from ID returns a string object as a temporary. That's an R value. The R value is passed through this parameter and forwarded to string as an R value where it is moved into the string data member. Which means that by replacing, if I go back one slide, by replacing a constructor taking a reference to a constant string object and replacing that with a templatized constructor taking a universal reference, we eliminate the inefficiencies that we had present before. So, seems okay, but at the same time, what I'm trying to tell you is you shouldn't be overloading on a universal reference. Well, here's a person constructor taking a universal reference. Here's a constructor taking an integer. That certainly looks like overloading to me. So the question is, where is the worry in doing something like this? OK, this is the same code as I just showed you, assuming that copy and paste works correctly. 
So this is supposed to be exactly the same as it was before. So let's just change the usage scenario a little bit. So in this case, let's assume that the way that I find the appropriate identifier for somebody is I have some block somewhere with a bunch of identifiers in it. So I go to the block to get the beginning of the block, and then I use some offset to find out exactly which ID I want. Think of an array, but more general than that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look up the ID and pass that in, pass in the name from that ID. So in this case, I say, okay, um, ID block is a function which returns an integer indicating the appropriate block to look up an ID. If I now say person P1 of ID block plus 22, well, ID block returns an integer, integer plus 22 is an integer, which means that we call this overload, which means we call name from ID, everything works exactly the way we expect. No surprises. If I now declare offset to be of type size t, size t is an unsigned type. If I now say id block, which returns an integer, and add the offset to it, I'm adding an integer and an unsigned of some kind. When you add an integer and an unsigned of some, some kind, the result is unsigned. So now I'm passing to the person constructor an object that is unsigned. Now, this is a universal reference. This constructor says, I take ints, or anything convertible to ints. And the universal reference says, I take everything. <laughs> and as a result, this call here passes that unsigned value to this constructor, which then forwards it to the string constructor, where you are attempting to initialize a string with an unsigned value. And your code does not compile. So what we really wanted to say was that this should accept any integer-like thing. But that's not what we said. This says it's the best match for anything except a non-const integer. This is the best match only for non-const integers. If I had a const int, you would call this one. It's a, it's a universal reference. It wants to match everything. So you were thinking, yeah, anything integer-like will match your best. Not what's going to happen. This only matches non-const integers. Function templates that take universal references are the greediest functions in C++. They will match anything with any kinds of qualifications. Now, we've already seen it is possible to beat them. So this will beat the universal reference because it's a normal function, not a template, but it will only do it for non-const integers. Any other type is going to match this function up here. So this is the fundamental concern I have with uh, universal references and overloading. Well, all right. Some people are going to look at this and say, this is so easy to solve. All we have to do is take the function with the universal reference and smack it over the head a few times with the template metaprogramming baseball bat. <laughs> and the problem will be solved. And I'm not looking at anybody right now, but you know who you are. <laughs> so what I can do is add another template argument that says, OK, I'm going to enable this only if it's not an integral type. So what I'm basically saying is I'm going to remove this template from consideration for any type which is an integral type. And that will have the effect that now, <clears throat> For all integral types, only this function overload will exist. Now, I happen to think that this is not terribly trivial in the first place. The more complicated the condition sets you wish to be able to do, especially if you have more than three, more than two overloads, the more complicated it gets. So it can be done, but it's not my preferred solution. Yeah? If you could back up one. Yeah. There's one more reason why you don't want to write a constructor like this, and this code still has the problem, which is under certain circumstances, that constructor can be used as a copy constructor. Um, maybe, but I'm so happy that you brought that up. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was going to be really unhappy, but actually I'm delighted. <laughs> because I want to talk about the special number functions. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. 
really, I was, I was, I was concerned, but now I'm, well, I'm still concerned considering how the first few slides went. <laughs> okay, um, there are certain functions in C++ that are automatically generated by the compiler under suitable circumstances. The official name for these functions is the special member functions. They're special <coughs> because they're automatically generated when certain conditions are fulfilled. The special member functions are the default constructor, the copy constructor, and the move constructor. Also, the copy and the move assignment operators and the destructor. The conditions under which they're, very, they're generated vary, but those are the special member functions. So what this means is if I have a widget class, then the copy constructor, um, all I care about for purposes of this discussion is the copy constructor and the move constructor. So I'm not going to worry about the default constructor or the destructor. So for purposes of this discussion, if I have a class widget under the right conditions, then the copy constructor with this signature may be generated. The move constructor with this signature may be generated. The copy assignment operator with this uh, signature may be generated. The copy assignment, excuse me, the move assignment oper operator with this signature may be generated. And I will remark right now, there are some edge cases where the copying operations actually have different signatures, but I'm not concerned about that. So this is the normal state of affairs. These are the four functions we are concerned with. So let us suppose I have a class which has a universal reference constructor. Now, this is the general form. I'm showing you widget, which obviously has no meaning. But let me go back to this person class. This is exactly the same form as this. It's a constructor which takes one argument, but is a universal reference. So going to the more general form, it looks like this. So here I have a constructor taking one argument, which is a universal reference. This is an assignment operator taking a universal reference. So when we write this constructor here, or this assignment operator here, they take universal references. Uh, excuse me, this is, universal, this is not a universal reference. That's an R value. This is And um, this should be T. This is not my day. <laughs> You're not going to believe me, but I actually did read through the talk several times. By having written these taking universal references, it appears that we cover all of our bases. L values and R values, cons and non cons, volatile and non volatile. Looks like we've covered everything because it's universal reference. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. And the reason it's not that simple is because if you have a template that can be instantiated, now let me try again. If you have a template, now let me try and make it even simpler. If you do not expressly declare the four special number functions we're concerned with here, copy, constru copy constructor, move constructor, copy assignment, move assignment, and there is code that uses them so that they need to be generated. If you have not declared those functions, they will be declared for you. And they will never be the result of template instantiations. So if you have a template in your class that could be instantiated to be the signature of one of the special number functions, then if one of those special number functions is required, your template will not be used. Instead, the functions themselves will be generated. So the existence of a template does not change the fact that the compiler will generate the special number functions under certain conditions. So, if I have a function here, so here's a constructor which takes anything. I think I'm covering everything, but in fact I'm not, because under the appropriate conditions, the compiler could silently generate this function and can silently generate this function. So all you see in the source code is the universal reference overload, but it is possible under certain conditions that these two functions are silently generated by the compiler, and now you have overloading on universal references. And similarly, if you write the, um, yeah. this type is consistent in getting it wrong. I like to say that everybody's correcting my code, so really, my preference pretty soon is going to be just to sit down and let you guys give the talk. <laughs> this looks like it handles everything for assignment. In fact, it does not, because these two 
special number functions under the appropriate conditions might still be generated. So, if you are writing a constructor taking a universal reference argument, you should be concerned immediately because that can inherently lead to the possibility of overloading on universal references. And similarly with the assignment operator. It's because of the existence of these special number functions. So the resulting behavior, again, can surprise you. So here, the blue code is what I wrote. So I said, look, I'm willing to be initialized with anything. That's, that's the code I put in my source file. But these two functions will be generated by the compiler if certain conditions are fulfilled. So here I've got w as a widget, cw as a const widget. So I say, OK, what I want to do is I want to copy an L value. Well, this is an L value of type widget, and it is non-const. Now, it could match the implicitly generated um, copy constructor, but that would require adding constness. Or I can instantiate this template to take just a widget ref. That is what will happen. So on this line here, where I copy an L value, it is going to call our universal reference constructor, which presumably is what you thought at the time that you wrote the code. Or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I say, OK, what I want to do is I want to take the non-const widget, and I want to turn it into an R value. Well, now I have, I'm creating a widget from an R value widget that is not const. That's an exact match for this signature, for the compiler-generated move operation. It will not instantiate the template. Instead, it's going to call this function here. So this call will not call the code that you wrote. If I have CW, which is a const widget, so I say I want to create a widget from a const widget, well, I can now um, I can instantiate this template to get an L value reference to const. It turns out you actually can have these two things simultaneously um, exist because one of them is a function, a template instantiation, one of them is a function, and they're different beasts. But because this is a function and this is a template instantiation, the rules of the game are, and this is true for C++ 98 as well, the rule is if you have a template instantiation that is an exact match for an argument, and you have a function, not a template, a function, that is an equally good exact match for the argument. You always call the function. And the thinking here is, if somebody writes a function that's more specific than writing a template, we call the more specific thing rather than the more general thing if they're equally good matches. So this line here will also not call your template. This is going to call the generated copy constructor here. Now remember, the gray code you don't see in your source file, potentially. It's generated by the compiler. If I now take the const widget and cast it to an R value, to an R value, well, I can't bind to this because it's an R value, so this is not going to be considered. This is an R value reference to non-const, so I can't call that. But I can instantiate this to get a reference, an R value reference to const. And as a result, this will call my template. So of these four calls, two of them call the template that I wrote, two of them do not. Although, presumably, at the time I wrote the template, I thought it was going to bind to everything, because Scott kept saying, it'll bind to everything, which it normally does, just not for the special member functions. <laughs> the situation is similar for non-member templates. Um, the only reason I put this slide in here is because everything I've shown you so far has involved member functions. I don't want you to walk away thinking, oh, this is some special member function rule. It's not. It's just a normal, run-of-the-mill, overloading resolution rule. So um, here's do work which takes an L value reference to const. Here's do work that takes a universal reference, which means everything. So in this case here, um, OK, W is still a widget. CW is still a const widget. I call do work with W. This is a non-const L value. So it could bind here with the addition of const, but it can get an exact match here. As a result, it's going to call the universal reference one, which is the trefref version. If I do standard move on W, this takes an R value, so I have a non-const R value. Well, the non-const R value could bind here, um, but again, you have to add constness. Instead, you can instantiate this here, and it will give you a non-const R value reference. So again, it calls the universal reference version. 
If I say do work of CW, this is a constant widget. This is a const L value. So this takes a const L value. As a result, this is a better match uh, than this because it takes a const L value. As a result, it calls the const tref version. And if I have the const um, L value and I cast it to be an R value, I have a const R value. And the const R value then can be made to bind exactly to this by the universal reference instantiating to be an R value reference to const. But again, what we see is what looks like symmetry in the source code. It looks like, oh, L values over here, R values over there. That's what it visually looks like. But that's not how it behaves. In three out of the four cases, it's going to bind to this one because despite this looking like an R value reference, it's really a universal reference, therefore can go either way. In my experience, the reason that you end up with overloading on universal references is because, first, um, you need to distinguish L values and R values, and the reason you want to distinguish them is for doing forwarding. Because you want to forward, you want perfect forwarding, and if you want perfect forwarding, you need a universal reference parameter. They're the only kinds of parameters which permit perfect forwarding. So, presumably you have a usage scenario where I need to get an argument and perfectly forward it to somebody else without losing L value and R value information. But, alas, some types are supposed to get special treatment. That's what leads to the motivation for overloading. That implies a non-universal reference parameter. So the question is, what do you do if you need to distinguish some special cases and you also need perfect forward? So that's the fundamental problem. Um, alas, I've spent 55 minutes introducing the problem. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I consider to be the preferable solution to the problem, and then I'm going to very briefly mention two other solutions. But you'll be able to get the notes if you want them, so you can always look up the details there. So, um, tag dispatching is a good way to, to solve the problem. Now, this is fundamentally what we can do. We are going to take a single function that will take a universal reference. Single function means no overload. And without the overloading, then what we're going to do is, inside that function, we're going to figure out, is this parameter that I just got, is it part of this set which should be treated in this way, or is it part of this other set that should be treated in another way? And then we're going to use a tag to distinguish between them and call another set of overloaded functions which don't have the problem of being overloaded on universal references. Let me show you. So here's the example of the person case. So here's the person. I only have one constructor here. So what I'm going to say is I will accept anything. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, call another person constructor. I'm using constructor delegation because this is C++ 11. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to call another person constructor where I will exactly forward the parameter that I got in. So I'm giving another constructor the parameter, but I'm going to pass a second parameter. The second parameter is the result of whether this thing is actually an integral type. And then I have two overloaded constructors. One takes a universal reference, but one of them takes true type. The other one takes a universal reference and takes false type. I am no longer overloading purely on universal references now. So now I'm distinguishing between the two cases by passing a second parameter. Yeah. Aren't you still getting the default one? Pardon me? Aren't you still getting the default one? So the question is, okay, what about those special member functions? We're going to get there, I promise. I even have an animation. <laughs> <laughs> and right now you should be thinking, if you hadn't wasted so much freaking time on the animation, maybe the other stuff would be. <laughs> that's what I'd be thinking. In fact, that's what I am thinking. <laughs> But I hope at the time you go, ooh, that was worth all the mistakes. <laughs> okay. So, in this case here, so here's the person constructor. It takes anything, but only for things where this expression is true. And this takes anything, but only things where this expression is false. And then in this case here, um, in this case here, this is true type. True type means that is integral on that thing was true. So I just received something of an integral type. So now I know, oh great, what that means is I want to initialize my string of type, my name of type string, by calling name from ID because I know that what I got is an integral type. Forwarding the parent. Now I will remark that in this particular case, I know that the type I got was integral. And I do not know of any use 
for distinguishing between integral L values and integral R values. I'm not saying there is no such use, but I don't know of any such use. However, if you get a universal reference parameter and you are going to forward it to some other function, the habit I strongly encourage you to get into is to always forward it by using forward. That's the habit you should get into. For integral types, it probably has no use, because I can't imagine somebody overloading on R value ints and L value ints. But it is possible, and somebody somewhere is probably going to come up with a use for it. But remember, calling forward and calling move are just casts. They generate no code. They have no friction at runtime. So the runtime cost of following the idiom is zero. So I encourage you to get the habit of doing it, which is why I'm doing it here. Yeah. What about the true type, false type, that extra parameter? Okay, so the question is. Those minor okay, so the question is, what about the true type, false type? Whether that is going to actually incur a runtime cost is going to depend on your compiler. So it could be that the compiler is going to say, look, you've passed a parameter here, it doesn't even have a name. It's never used, and therefore this is dead code. So it is possible that your compiler will do the overloading resolution during compilation and will simply omit the passing of the parameter. That is possible. It is also possible that the compiler will not do that analysis, in which case um, you will pass some small object as an additional parameter, either in a register or on the stack. Um, personally, I would not worry about the cost of doing that unless I was you know, really running the most efficient possible code, and I did some profiling that it showed that my compiler was actually generating code in a production build with the appropriate optimization settings, and it was um, generating um, some code that, that cost me something. But, so, so it could go either way. Okay, so that's tag dispatch. So the net effect now is that here's the ID block example, and here's the size T offset. So in this case, uh, that's ID block plus 22, this is fine, it passes an int. ID block plus offset, it's fine, it passes the size T, but it still will do the name lookup rather than passing it to the string constructor. For non-integral types, they're going to be perfect forward to the private constructor. So in, here's um, our example with JK Rowling. This still copies JK Rowling into name. It will be perfect forwarded as an L value to the string constructor. It will therefore be copied, just like it was before. <clears throat> if I try to do name from ID, then this will produce a standard string object as its return value. That's an R value. The R value will then be perfect forwarded through the perfect forwarding constructor to the string constructor, where it will be moved into name. It's optimally efficient. If I pass in the string literal John Grisham, the string literal will be perfect forwarded to the string constructor, which will then initialize the name from the string literal John Grisham. Again, optimally efficient. And if I try to initialize P6 with 3.583, well, that's a double last I checked. So if we go back and we take a look at the overloads. So is integral is going to fail which means that a floating point number will be forwarded through um, this constructor here, which means we'll, float, we'll forward the floating point number to the string constructor, at which point you're going to get an error because you cannot initialize a string object with a double. So that'll work. Except we have those pesky special member functions. And suddenly we begin to think, you know, those remember functions, they're special. But we have to deal with them, because they will still be generated by the compiler under exactly the same kinds of conditions I mentioned before. So the first thing I'm going to say is, what you want to do is think carefully about, do you really want to write a constructor taking an argument that is a universal reference? I mean, you have to really ask yourself, do you really want to do that? If the answer is, eh, I can probably live without it, your life will be easier. <clears throat> but if your answer is, no, that really is what I want to do. <clears throat> or, if you're like me, and you go, I don't know if I want to do it, I just want to see how you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so let's assume that for some reason you really do want to have those special member functions. Okay, this is what you need to do. You need to make sure the compiler doesn't generate them. So, you're going to have to declare them yourself. 
And then the question is, okay, well, what do you do? Well, if I wrote a constructor that's supposed to take absolutely everything, then what I really want to do is I want to declare, let's say, in this case, this is the copy constructor. What I really want to say is, okay, this is the copy constructor, and whatever its argument is, I want to pass it to the perfect forwarding constructor. So what I really want to do is have the copy constructor call this constructor. Which leads to the question, well, how the heck do you do that? So what you do is, you take your parameter, okay, RHS is a type person. So this is the copy that we're copying a person. What I want to do is I want to forward the name, because it's the name data member which was supposed to have been passed in. So RHS.name is what I'm going to pass. Now, RHS has an address, which means it's an L value, which means RHS.name is an L value. Now, if I just called person with RHS.name, um, I'm pretty sure we can get infinite recursion, uh, which is only fun the first million or two of some, or so, uh, so times. So that's a bad idea. But this is what we're going to do. RHS.name, which is an L value, I'm going to cast it to be an R value. Now, because it's an R value, it can't call this function. This only, um, excuse me, it can call this function. This is an L value reference to const. <coughs> now, notice that RHS is already const. RHS.name is a const string. Right? Everybody agree? RHS.name is a const string because RHS is const. So I'm casting this to be an R value. So what I have now is a const R value. This template can be instantiated for this to become a const person, excuse me, a const string R value reference. And if that's the case, we then have const string R value reference <coughs> here. Um, now, actually, we're in good shape here. So this becomes a const R value reference, but forwards to this constructor here. And then we need the name of it. Um, it passes it as a const R value. It passes it as a const R value. So it is an R value, but it's const. When it gets to the string constructor, the string constructor overload is going to say, okay, I can get an L value or an R value, but the R value reference overload only takes non-const R values. So it will, it will end up copying the name. Make sense? Yeah. Two things. Yeah. Um, I don't think stiff move is necessary here at all. If you just pass rhs.name, then you're going to be passing the string a const string L value ref, and it will end up in the correct yeah, no, copy right. constructor. Yeah. The other problem here um, is that the um, the very first copy con uh, the, the very first constructor that you've defined there, the universal reference one, mm -hmm. uh, will get called uh, to copy a non-const person. Correct. Which, since it is not an integral, will be passed to the string constructor, the string constructor and, and we will be fail. attempting And we will be attempting to construct a string from a person, which presumably will not compile. So this is not how you do this. In, in, the, in this particular example, I agree with you, this is not how you would do this. Um, This particular part of the discussion is predicated on the assumption that you did decide you really do want to have a constructor which takes anything. And I agree, it doesn't mesh very well with the other motivation I gave um, for, for an example of doing that. But you can still do that. You do need the, uh, the metaprogramming baseball bat, though. And <laughs> able <laughs> Yes. Um, I am perfectly willing to believe that you can do it, and I'm perfectly willing to believe that you can do it with the metaprogramming baseball bat. What I'm not convinced of, and I'm not arguing, I'm just saying what I, what I have not yet convinced myself of is that the only way to do it is with the metaprogramming baseball. I know that there are problems related to this kind of stuff that can only be resolved using metaprograms. Whether the one that, that I'm addressing is, is one of those, I don't know. Well, another solution would be to also define the copy constructor that takes a non-const person. Right. Ref. So that one will, will be the one that's preferred. I'd have to sit down and take a look at the code. Okay. 
Okay. Um, let me go a little bit further with this because I am actually trying to get somewhere. If we if we proceed on the assumption that let me go back one slide. Um, if we proceed on the assumption that this makes sense, and it's already been pointed out that the move is not necessary here, but if we proceed on the assumption that this is a reasonable template, then we can do exactly the same thing with the assignment operator. So basically, if we can solve it for con copy for construction, we can solve it for assignment as well in the same way. In this particular case, once we've handled copy construction and copy assignment, we don't need to worry about move construction and move assignment. Because the rules in C++11 are that if you have declared a copying function, then you do not automatically get move functions. So by declaring, in this case, the copy assignment operator, that will prevent the compiler from generating either the move assignment operator or the move constructor. So we don't have to worry about that implicit overloading anymore. So the rules for when move operations are generated are more constrained than the rules for when the copying operations are generated. So if you cover the copying case by expressly declaring them, you've solved the move case. All right, so this is the way things break down. So this is my universal reference constructor, which is going to be using tag dispatch. And this is the copying function that I have to write to prevent the compiler from writing for me. And I have it called this function here. They, um, this function here then dispatches down to the two overloads for true type and false type on is integral. And I can do the same thing with the assignment operator. So here is the universal reference version of the assignment operator. This is the version, um, this is the copy version of the assignment operator, which I have to declare myself. It simply forwards up here, which ultimately calls the two uh, assigned templates down here for true type and for false type. This business of having to expressly declare, expressly uh, deal with the copying constructor and the copy assignment operator arises only because we're dealing with the special member functions. If we didn't have the special member functions, this would not be an issue. So that's my preferred approach for dealing with the problem of overloading on universal references. In a nutshell, it's don't overload. Instead, write one function which takes a universal reference and internally use tag dispatching to then call two or more functions internally using the result of some tag computation. That eliminates the need to overload. And then you have the edge case of if you are really trying to do it on a constructor which takes any argument, you have to worry about the fact that that will generate conflicts with the overloads that the compiler will generate for you for the copying and moving operations. Now we've already gone longer than the talk should have, and I apologize for that, so I just want to mention in passing two other approaches you can take to the problem. So the second one is to simply do pass by value. If you do pass by value, it would look like this. So in this case, person takes a string object. Notice it's not taking the reference. And it also is overloaded on taking an integer. This eliminates all kinds of ambiguities, which is very, very nice. And in the particular case of string, which is efficient to move, it doesn't cost you very much. How much it costs you depends on what you're taking. In this case, a string has a cheap move operation. It's typically uh, moving something like 12 bytes on a 32-bit architecture, three pointers, basically. Um, more if you've got a custom allocator. But typically, it's, it's a matter of moving three pointers, so it's very efficient. On the other hand, if this were not a string object, if this were an object that was expensive to move, uh, as, as an example, a standard array object in C++11, which uh, have, takes uh, linear time to move, then this becomes a more expensive solution. Um, I'll make the slides available after I've fixed some of the mistakes, after I've fixed as many mistakes as I know about. Um, so, I'm, so I'm just going to, you can see that uh, it, it shows you how it plays out. You always end up constructing that by value parameter. So if I go back two slides, you are clearly going to pay for the construction of this. So that's, that's a cost you will incur regardless of whether you pass an L value or an R value. Now, the thing is, 
this local variable, you know you're never going to use again after the end of the function. So you can, you can cast it, uh, you can use a move inside, which you'll see right here. You can do a move because you know you're never going to need to use it again, and, and so you only have to copy it once. But the end result is if you sort of work your way through the analysis, you'll find out that under some conditions you're paying a little bit more than you would with the universal reference. But it eliminates a lot of ambiguities. Um, it also avoids what I call perfect forwarding failure cases. Um, and I'll give you a reference where you can go and read about perfect forwarding failure cases. Um, perfect forwarding is a great technology, and it works almost all the time. Now, we already know that one of the cases where it doesn't work is if you pass a braced initializer list. Because templates can't figure out a type for braced initializer list, so you cannot perfect forward braced initializer lists. On the other hand, if you pass a braced initializer list to this constructor, it will happily deduce that you have passed it the contents of a straight object. So, it has some other advantages. Um, I just want to mention in passing, because sometimes people get carried away, if you are declaring a function taking a universal reference, but you only need to read its value. You don't need to modify it. You're only going to look at it. Fall back on C++ 98. Do it the way that we did it for 13 years and had no guilty consciences, which is take an L value reference to const. That binds to L values, and it binds to R values, and it guarantees that they're const. So if you don't need to modify it, don't even do this whole overloading nonsense. Just take the L value reference to const and be done with it. So, this is the guideline that I have. Um, overloading on an R value reference plus an L value reference, typically that is okay. That is the standard way to say L values are dealt with in this way, R values are dealt with in this other way. Overloading on a universal reference is typically not okay, and you want to find a way to avoid that if you possibly can. When I'm thinking about how do I keep these things straight, I always think about vector, and in particular, I think about the difference between pushback in vector and in place spec in vector. And the reason I do it is because vector is a template class, so it's got this type T. Now, notice that I have pushback that takes a T reference. Now, this looks like it has the proper form for a universal reference, but this type T is not being deduced in this function call. The type T in pushback is determined by the type of the vector. If I have a vector of int, this is an int refref. If I have a vector of widget, this is a widget refref. The type of this t is not deduced. As a result, this is not a universal reference. So this is normal overloading on L value reference and R value reference, which, as I said up here, typically OK. On the other hand, in place spec, which is its own template, does take arguments whose types have to be deduced when you call the template function. As a result, this is a universal reference. This accepts anything. We therefore do not expect to see overloading on in place back. And if you take a look at the vector uh, class, you'll see it isn't overloaded. So pushback, no type deduction, you get um, you can therefore do overloading. In place back, type deduction, no overloading. So the guideline is to avoid overloading on universal references. And if you want to get some more information um, on universal references, so this is the articles in the talk that I gave. Um, it's, it looks like about nine months old now. Like I said, my, my thinking has changed a little bit on that. I mentioned in passing this interaction of universal references and initializer list. There was a Stack Overflow thread on this talking about what happens if you do have overloading on universal references and a user passes an initializer list, then what happens? So that's an interesting place to go to. Uh, this is where you can go for information on perfect forwarding failure cases. It talks about the situations where perfect forwarding does not work. If you're interested in, um, in the discussion specifically of overloading and universal references, I had a couple of log entries on parameter types and constructors and copying constructors in C11. And there have been a couple of recent discussions about this. One of them is overloading the broken universal reference. Uh, that's not by me, so you can't blame me for the title. This is another example of tag dispatching. And uh, then there was a Stack Overflow article, Overload Resolution with Universal References, which is um, showing a different approach to solving the problem that happens to be based on an able diff um, as opposed to the tag dispatch, which I showed. So that is the end of the talk. Uh, first, I apologize for running about an hour and 20 minutes, which I really didn't mean to do, so I'm sorry about that. Secondly, I apologize for the mistakes in the talk. 
and I will um, not take questions because it is so late, but I will hang around as long as people wish to ask me questions. And what about um, the animation? For me? <laughs> the animation. <laughs> 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 You didn't see the text fade to a lighter blue? <laughs> I wouldn't say it was a good animation. <laughs> have you done animations in PowerPoint? Do you have any animation? <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 I want to point out. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> trying to find suitable clip art for this <laughs> And I spent another 20 minutes messing around with all the possible word art <laughs> to make that thing look wavy. So I think I deserve some credit for dedication to the cause. <laughs> didn't waste so much time playing with PowerPoint, <laughs> the text would have been correct. So, thank you very much for coming.